which is Harris and Diana Haywood. Harris and Diana both have a narrow monoslope barn, and so in reference to some of the questions here earlier, I think they can give you uh, their opinion of what's worked with for them. Um, I think Diana said she was going to serve as a backup here, and right now we'll have Harris do the presentation. Okay, I, I brought her along because she is the financial officer. If there's any questions on prices of and economy of the buildings and stuff, she has the answers. She's a computer genius. <laughs> this is one of the, these barns were put up. We started with our first ones back in the early 2000, about 14 years ago. Uh, year before, we had all outside cattle, and that winter was the winter that we had snow turn to mud. We had cattle clear up over their bellies, and that's when we started looking. Uh, we went up into uh, the dairy country of Wisconsin. We heard about some monoslope barns that they put up for, uh, for their heifer uh, retention and grower. We took that uh, design, come down, start building our own barns. We now have nine of these barns. Uh, 450 head each and uh, have gotten along real good. They are 40 foot deep and like Joel said on his barns the sun will go will go clear to the back walls of them so that gives us uh, in the winter time when the sun is in the south we'll reach all the way back. In the summertime the sun is straight up so what we did was we built this little overhang out here and it shades our bumps that are on the outside of our barns and also that keeps the rain and snow off the bumps but it will shade it all the way through the summer that they have shade all the way through they always run east and west so that the sun, south sun will always reach in with our curtains on the back uh, but we were a little different on our barns is that uh, we run out of space. Head count for, you heard about the CAFO. Uh, we were getting too many head per location, so we went to all of our grain farmer neighbors and they started building barns for us. They own the barns, we rent them. Uh, we started putting up two on each location so that we'd stay under a thousand head at each location. Uh, they wanted the manure. Manure is very, very valuable, and people need to be thinking about that, that it definitely is your second crop after you sell the cattle. Um, we do sell a lot of our manure. Um, our ground has been covered for so many years that we need to move it out, and it is, it is a very good income. Um, like I said, our buildings are built on other people's farms. They own them. They have no interest in them. They don't know anything about cattle, but they definitely want that. They definitely want that manure pile. That's what they're doing. Our barns are are bedded, as you can see, the manure around the waters. Uh, we only clean out every five to six weeks. We don't really care about the cattle's condition of dirt and mud on them. They are as long as they are very comfortable. Um, that's our main goal and it doesn't bother them, it doesn't bother me. My dad always said a happy calf is a good tasting calf. Uh, so we just try to keep the cattle happy and uh, it, isn't, it isn't a problem. Like I don't remember which one of our panelists said something about the manure getting on the skin and pulling off. Definitely you do not want to see that, but uh, we will keep them dirty. Um, it's kind of like a person that wants to lay down on it and doesn't have any furniture, would you rather lay down on a carpet or would you rather lay down on a cement floor? You're going to like that carpet much better, so they always want something soft under their feet. Next one. Um, our pin sizes. We got pin sizes 150 to 75 head. Uh, we keep different size cattle, so uh, we have to keep them in different size pins. They're usually in the pins all their life. But uh, we are a custom feedlot, and we have customers that will range in sizes of, of uh, number of head and cattle. We do feed everything from 300-pound Holsteins to 15-year-old 
cows that are embryo transfers. So we've had about everything in these barns, and just as long as we can keep them comfortable and happy, that's our main goal. Uh, we do own 50% of those buildings that we're trying to figure out how to pay for. <laughs> like I said, she might be the chief financial officer, but I'm still the boss. I get the last word. Yes, dear. <laughs> We feed once daily, and this is our, our rations that we throw in on it. And uh, like I said, we've got fence line bunks. And here is our bedding machine. We are a little different. We do not want to go in the pens. We don't want to stir up the cattle. Uh, we have a, I call it a salad shooter, and it will take cornstalk bale. And this is a long spout. We can drive down the bunks and shoot it right in and cover the bedding. It's called um, a white saver. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, don't have to have anyone in the pens. We don't uh, injure any of the cattle. And so that's our main goal is to keep the cattle comfortable. And they, they see that bedding machine come. They go absolutely nuts. And you'll see them uh, open their mouths and stand right underneath that spout. <laughs> Handling. Yes, like I said, it's every five to six weeks. Uh, we do stockpile it for fall, winter, and spring hauling. So all summer it will get stockpiled out in out in our uh, little areas on each end of, of the barns. We are uh, CNMP uh, approved and have all of our permits to keep in check. And we do have uh, uh, once in a while we do have a. Uh, uh, People from the state like to come out and take a look and see what we're doing. But so far, they've always been happy with everything we've done. Uh, when we started this, it, uh, each state's going to be different. Definitely get together and talk. Uh, your DNRs and everyone needs to be on the exact same page when you, before you even start. Uh, they can be a real hassle if they see your building and come, come after you've started. So definitely get everything, all your ducks in a line before you start. We were on the cutting edge with these buildings, and in our area in central Iowa, uh, the only manure that they dealt with was liquid manure. And so when we come in the solid pack, they try to inflict the same rules on the solid pack as the liquid manure. And so it, 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 uh, Russ helped us. Uh, I don't know if Beth was in on that. Uh, we had to deal with the DNR a lot to finally get approved to build. They were definitely under uh, hog confinements and did not know anything about solid manure or how to handle it or how to store it. Uh, they definitely wanted us to make a pit and when telling them how I would never be able to get my manure back out of the pit, they said, well, how come? Well, hog guys do it all the time. And it, it was very hard to get get the state to figure out that this manure is not the exact same kind of manure that you're going to see in a hog barn. Uh, this is good solid manure and it will take you some time to get everything figured out, but uh, they, they, they are helpful and they will help you out. My curtains are the same as Joel's had on his. We have the top curtain, we have the bottom curtain. We do lower our bottom curtain about halfway for winter and leave it that way. So there's about a two foot gap here and the two and a half, three foot gap on top. Let's air go through, but in case of a blizzard or something, we do lock them all down. Harris, tell about the ventilation on the front. That's why we just come to the next page here, but here. <laughs> Up on top of it is uh, what we call our exhaust ventilation. This is a two foot gap that is right up here on the top. Airflow will go up this line and take all of our steam and heat and even on a very calm day if you come up here and stood it blow your hat off the air does flow through there very very quickly and it does keep all of our uh, vapors and steam and even the smell out of the out of the barn um, when we do close up the back end with curtains in the winter time you can get quite a bit of steam and fog in there so uh, by keeping the top open as much as possible, it does keep the airflow going and, and keep the cattle very comfortable. Wear and tear on the buildings, everything is cement. The back walls are all cement. Cattle cannot touch anything but cement. 
Um, main wear and tear is just hinges and gates and stuff. This is a, a, a half a barn. These gates are locked open because it's a small pin and a large pin. And since they're all the same cattle, we just lock the gates back and let them have the whole, whole pin on that one. Um, yeah, what's worked well is year-round comfort. Uh, we talked about the ventilation. Uh, a lot of people uh, remember the old corn cribs. You go stand in an alley on the, in the middle of July. It's usually the coolest place on the farm. And the, these barns are the same way. Absolutely no air can be moving. You can stand in the middle of them and feel a breeze. And it's always a cool breeze. Uh, the sun penetration going to the back in the in wintertime helps dry the barns and keeps the air ventilation going through there too. Um, what would have surprised us? Uh, efficiency. Feed efficiency, $7 corn, makes you really start thinking about feed efficiency. Um, we were seeing, we still run our outside lots. We still have our barns. We did a trial on exact same cattle inside and outside. Um, 7.6 was the feed efficiency of our outside cattle. 6.4 feed efficiency of the inside cattle. Um, over a pound difference on $7 corn, you, you, you do the math. Um, it helps pay for the barns real quick when you start figuring the feed efficiency. Average daily gain was absolutely no difference. Strictly feed efficiency. Um, next. Okay, we talked about our curtains and the airflow, and uh, things we've changed. Uh, one of my first barns, I was cheap. I thought the cement was too expensive. Went with a four-foot uh, wall instead of five. I had to put on a guardrail. That kept the cattle from chewing on my <coughs> on my uh, wood. So definitely spend a little extra money. Um, make sure the cattle cannot touch anything. That's wood because they love wood. So you're going to want to have good cement. Our cement's six inches reinforced all the way around. Uh, we can take our payloader, bang into them, and uh, not affect the walls at all. Uh, also, uh, talking about payloaders and, and equipment, um, we did start with a loader tractor, cleaning barns, our first barn. It wasn't long before you're going to want something pretty good size. Uh, our payloaders work good. Um, our, four, our 450 head barns are 300 foot long. Um, I can get in a payloader, move the cattle out of the barns, and we do move cattle out of our barns when we clean them every five, six weeks. They go out to the playpen. Uh, we got outside lots that we move them out, scrape them, and definitely bed before you put them back in. Um, they want to play, they're going to hurt themselves. Slippery wet floors is not good for cattle. And that brings me to the flooring. Um, look at, um, of all my barns, look at the tread. Do something to make sure there's always tread on the floor. If you're going to put in a cement floor, um, you need traction for them cattle, plus you need traction for your uh, unloading or scraping equipment. But also, but definitely for the cattle, they can they can slip off easy on cement. So um, look at different kinds of tread. We've done lines, we've done diamonds. Um, our last barns, we made a homemade basket that the contractor rolled and made little diamond plates on the floor, and that seems to be our best traction. So anyway, there's all kinds of things out there, but definitely when you're going to pour cement with cattle around. Make sure you've got good traction. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, and what we've changed again was was our was our older barns. We had cement walls separating um, for cleaning purposes. You're going through taking all cattle out of barns. It's just as easy to swing gates wide open and go from one end to the other. Clean them out fast. Get the cattle back in. The longer they're outside, the less gain you're going to get, so you want them back on the feet as fast as possible. So that was one of our only things that we really changed in the barns was gone with more gates. And uh, out in front, of course, our bunks are outside the barns, so the cattle get all the, all the space in under roof. 
mainly when we started doing this, we looked at putting alleys in and decided we wanted the cattle to have the roof more than than us. So that's why we put our bunks on the south side, outside. Best thing could happen would be if in the real world, um, I could roof even out there <laughs> the outside. But yeah, when you're looking at money and stuff, you want to do the most economical. This is, this is the most economical that I could find. And that's about it, and we'll have our last one. We won't let Harris quite off here yet. Do you have, we have time to take one or two questions? Yes? The question was about the front steel awning, whether it was steel or translucent. Steel or translucent. Yeah, it's a good question. It, it, it is translucent that we put up there uh, so it let light in, but it still uh, repel off the sunlight or the, the direct sun uh, in the summertime still makes shade. But uh, yes, it is translucent so it gets good lighting into the barns. Yes. You have a quite unique system with your uh, farmers that own part of the barns and such. Whose economic cost is the manure handling? Is that on your operation or is that the farmer's operation to he's, handle that? He's, he's, ask, re repeat, yeah. Yeah, he's asking uh, about uh, our contracts with uh, farmers that own barns, um, what he does for the manure. Um, we, we give him a rent check every year. <coughs> Uh, it's it's a minimal rent check because of the manure. We figure out the cost of the manure. He gets the manure for free. We charge him for putting it on fields because uh, sometimes uh, the one particular guy likes us to take it five to six miles away. So to put it on a truck, haul it, and uh, reload it and spread it is uh, not that economical. So we do charge just for the deliveries. So of the manure, but the manure is, is theirs for free. We've made different arrangements with different guys, but um, uh, work hand in hand with them. Uh, one person, we buy corn stalks back from him. We spread the manure, um, pay him rent, and uh, just made some really neat working partnerships in our area to uh, add to the economy of our, of our county. That's, that's another thing that uh, Joel brought up too, is uh, uh, we do have a lot of neighbors that um, we get corn stalks from in trade for manure. Uh, that seems to be a nice arrangement to, to keep uh, the manure moving around and uh, all our neighbors are, are clamoring to, to give us corn stalks so they can have the manure too. So that, that, that is one way of, of if, you, if your farms are getting heavily covered with manure for years and years and need to move it. That's one way of, of uh, moving it around. I, I did hear a comment this morning when the, uh, they were talking about applying manure and everything. Someone uh, beside us said, well, the next thing you know, you'll be putting on manure with GPS. Yes, we do. 